All right, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Creditor Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Palmieri, and with me today is Anthony Ha. Anthony Ha is a senior writer at TechCrunch, where he covers media and advertising, and he co-hosts the Original Content Podcast. Previously, he worked as a tech writer at Adweek and a senior editor at VentureBeat. Anthony, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So full disclosure for listeners, Anthony and I met a little over a year ago when Creditor was closing its angel round. And we more recently had a discussion when he was moderating a panel for Pointer's international fact-checking network called the Tech Startups Fighting Misinformation. I'm very excited for this conversation because Anthony, you're one of the best people in the industry to speak with about the changing media landscape. And today I get to flip the table and ask you the questions. (laughs) Um, And I'd like to start with just a very general question, which is, in your opinion, is our news media in trouble? That is a, that is a big question. Um, I'm going to say yes, with lots of asterisks, just to sort of cover my butt a little bit. But um, I think that certainly... I mean, that, that's true. There's certainly a lot of things that, that are going to create a lot, that have created a lot of turmoil for the news industry and will continue to do so. A lot of that is um, the, you know, the business model changes that have been caused by the internet, social platforms, by the shift to mobile. Um, a lot of that has to do with, you know, this kind of misinformation landscape that we're living in now. Um, and I mean, you know, a lot of it, I think, some of these companies, frankly, you know, had a period where they could get away with just not being the best businesses, not necessarily having the best news practice. I'm not, I, don't, I'm, I realize I'm painting with a bit of a broad brush here, but I think there, there's a lot of different things. Some of the wounds in the news industry are self-inflicted. A lot of them have to do with sort of broader trends. And one of those broader trends, of course, and this is something you cover, is the intersection of advertising with our online media today. Um, it, I think it seems evident, uh, I'll paint with a broad, a broad brush now, it seems evident that more news media, more journalism in general seems to be working on behalf of advertisers in, in the way of chasing clicks and traffic, as opposed to maybe what's a focus on the best interest of the readers. Um, I'm wondering if you think that there's a way that we can ever reconcile this or if advertising is always gonna be kind of a necessary way of supporting online media. I think that certainly I think words like always and never, I'm, I'm incredibly cautious to, to use because I think, you know, uh, things change really dramatically. Um, and, and uh, you know, just thinking about, you know, the, the news landscape that was in place when I was in, in college and, and how it seemed at the time that like newspapers were a great business. TV was a great business. And, and that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case anymore. And, and so I and we've sort of treated it as if this, these were like eternal truths. And it was always going to be that way. And the way these businesses should be, should be run, that was exactly how these businesses should always be run. And, and I don't think that's the, the case. I mean, certainly you're right that um, advertising creates a lot of really bad incentives in, for the industry. And, and I get a little bit sensitive about this when people bring it up sometimes, because I think most journalists don't spend a ton of time thinking, what is the exact way to have this story get the most clicks? Um, I'm sure there are journalists who do that. And, and certainly you hear stories about Gawker, for example, would have a, a dashboard on the wall that would just show how all the different writers traffic was at that moment in time, which sounds nightmarish to me. Um, but, and, and I'll be, you know, that's not just because of advertising, but advertising obviously is the underlying business model behind the idea of just the more, um, the more views, the better. And, and, you know, there are a lot of, companies that are now exploring subscription models. And I don't, I'm right now, I'm also wary of the idea of like, there's one answer for the industry. And I think it's going to differ uh, depending on publication. Certainly, you know, the New York Times is going to be able to attract a lot more subscribers than um, a small local publication. And so I, I don't want to say it's one size fits all. I do think that certainly there's value in advertising in the sense that there's value in having news that's accessible to everyone. And, you know, obviously I'd love to see maybe more of that as like a nonprofit model or, or other things where it's not just how do you get the most clicks, but I'm, I'm also really excited to see that 
there's there people are exploring more than one business model because it's certainly five or ten years ago it really just seemed like everything was about scale everything was about just getting the most eyeballs possible and you know getting the most ad revenue as a result of that and the fact that i don't think every publication is chasing that now i think is a very good thing yeah and one of the points of this show is to try to get the inside the newsroom perspective um so you mentioned writers possibly not thinking about clicks and, and virality as much as maybe news consumers think they are when they're crafting a piece. If you can try to be like brutally honest with us, is it something that sits in the back of your mind when you're writing a piece or when you're crafting a headline? Is it something you maybe just check in with at the beginning when you're thinking about how to craft the story or at the end when you, when you say, is this something I can see people wanting to share because they enjoy it? How do you think as a writer when you're crafting a piece about shareability or virality or clicks? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it depends on the, uh, all, partly on the publication because when I was at Adweek, for example, they didn't share any traffic data with us. So we had no idea how our stories were doing. And, but, which sounds in some ways ideal, but it actually made us a little bit crazy, I think, because we wanted to know how our stories are doing. And so we paid so much attention to the widget on the website that said here are our st top stories right now because that was the one piece of information we had about what was actually working um and so so i think that's you know versus at TechCrunch where we do have access to a wide range of analytics tools but our editors have never at least i've never had a conversation where an editor was really like giving me a, a hard time for not having more traffic than I do. Um, I mean, some of that is because we cover technology. And so um, there are different kinds of technology will attract different readership. So for example, writing a story about Credder, no offense, will probably get fewer views than a story about the new iPhone. And definitely they're very, but we understand that at TechCrunch, we're part of our identity is covering startups. And so writing a story about a cool media startup is, part of our identity and we would never judge that story by the same standards. Um, all of which is to say that we, we think about it, but it's like a big part of like just a bunch of different things that, that we look at. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I think there are, again, organizations, um, although fewer probably than people imagine, and I think a lot of them aren't really in business anymore, um, that really focus on that. But for the most part, there's certainly a question I'll think like, what is, particularly if I'm writing about something that I think could be potentially very popular, whether that's a startup that like no one's written about yet and I know is about to get a lot of attention or if it's about something with Apple or Google or Facebook, then you think about what is the headline that's gonna get the, the, the most attention? What is the, you know, an image that's gonna attract, um, you know, eyeballs and, and things like that. So I, I, think, I do think about it because when I write something, I want people to read it. I would prefer that, that more people read it than, than fewer. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's usually not the, the main reason, for example, that I choose to write a story. Um, and, and again, I, I, I think there's a little bit of, there are certainly publications like, like, I mean, I guess to use the sort of kind of easy example would be like the Daily Mail. You, you read the Daily Mail and you can see the headlines are written to get you to click on it and to be like, what are they talking about? Um, and, and that, you know, that's sort of, again, that predates the internet. That's, that's also just something to do with like the kind of like tabloid style. Um, so I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I think there are a lot of journalists for whom that um, that's usually not the main motivation. So what about the idea of being first with the story? So obviously in today's media environment, there are real advantages to being the first one to break a story. It can get shared around quickly before other outlets can get their story to the press. Um, and also in search algorithms, if you're the first story that broke on something, it's much more likely that if it's a, you know, a story that lasts for a year or people keep checking back in on it, it's very likely that your story will be at the top of those search results. How do you think about, um, or maybe how, do, how does TechCrunch or other just media in general, do you think, think about trying to be the first out with a story? Again, I think it sort of becomes one element in sort of uh, kind of matrix of, of different things that we look at. And certainly it is true that, that that first, I mean, has all the advantages that you're describing. And there's just simply a point of pride, right? To being able to say, I was the first person to, to write about this. Um, but it also depends on what the story is in the sense that if you, um, again, so let's say like Apple sends out a press release that says, 
here are the details of the new iPhone. They probably wouldn't do it this way, but let's say they did. Um, or, or, you know, then there's a press conference and Apple is, uh, you know, announcing all the details of the new iPhone. Being first and being fast is ha something of an advantage there, but at the same time, a lot of other publications are gonna have that information very, very quickly. Whereas if you are first and you have something that other publications can't replicate, then that becomes a much bigger advantage because then it's a factor of everyone has to link to you because you've got this information that they don't and you're the one who's really spurring the conversation as opposed to the timestamp on your story happens to be a few minutes earlier than, than someone else's. And so I, I, there are times when certainly I would rather wait on a story than, than publish it. If, if, because sometimes people are like, just, like, just hit, write the, the basic information and then hit publish and then we can expand it later on. And I think there are certain kinds of news where that is of value. Um, but I think most of the time I'd rather have um, a story that's actually, you know, full and fleshed out and actually serves the reader. And, and I mean, one of the things we, we talk about is, you know, if you, if you can't be first, be, be best. And I don't know that I would necessarily claim that I'm the, the best at covering something all the time, but I think that's a good thing to keep in mind about, you know, being first is, is great. Being, whether you're second or you're fourth or you're sixth, I think probably makes less difference than did you do some, are you, you have to be timely, but then can you do something that actually people want to read and share? Yeah, do you set personal goals or, or are there goals set upon you by TechCrunch that you should try to put out a certain number of stories per day? Um, so I think a million years ago, I was told that the goal was uh, 10 stories a week, um, which seemed like a lot um, when I was first writing, working for a newspaper. Um, and, and sometimes people, when I say 10 stories a week, their eyes kind of get wide and they're like, what? Um, although I'm sure there are other um, bloggers who'd be like, that's nothing. Um, partly because, you know, a story can mean a lot of different things. It can be just, here's some new, here's a paragraph about the news. Here's a bit of context. Maybe here's a joke or a quote. And, and then you're done and you can finish that fairly quickly in a few minutes. Other things can be much more involved and take hours of reporting and work or, or more. And so um, they, they've really moved away from a, a quota system per se, whether that's number of articles or, or traffic. I think it, it's more about looking overall and saying, um, are, a, are, you, are you being relatively productive? Because we are a, a you know, a, a more than, you know, I guess, and I don't know what the right term is. I was going to say daily, but um, we are, you know, it's a 24 seven news organization. And so we're not like, New Yorker writers who can spend six months working on, on one piece and nothing else. Um, but at the same time, uh, that, that there's also something to be said for focusing our energies on what's effective. And, and effective can mean different things, whether that's getting a lot of traffic, we have an extra crunch subscription program, so it could be driving a lot of subscriptions or just driving conversation in, in other ways. And so if I have fewer articles and, um, but I'm like, doing really well in other ways, I think my editors are perfectly happy with me. And conversely, if I publish a whole bunch of articles, but none of them really seems to be getting much attention, the fact that I published a lot of articles is only going to get me so far. Right. And, and I think you're, um, I know you're based in New York. Is that where you're talking to us from today? That's right. This is my home office in Harlem, where I've spent a really, really, really large amount of the last seven months. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to ask you about is I, I'd imagine that as a tech writer, you do most of your work remote and just via computer and cell phone. But how has the coronavirus, because obviously New York was hit pretty hard, how has that affected the day to day of the job for you? I think a lot of the basic stuff hasn't changed because like you said, um, we do most of this work online anyway. And I so I'm, I'm in New York, as I mentioned, I used to work out of San Francisco and I remember being a little worried when I left San Francisco. Um, but I realized that like sometimes, you know, if there was like big news coming out of these companies, it wasn't like I was going to like drive down to Menlo Park or Mountain View and go knocking on the door anyway. I mean, there, you know, physical proximity matters a bit, but most of these conversations are happening just as they are now um, via Zoom, via phone, via email, via Slack. Uh, so that, that's been fine. I mean, I think the real big changes are, A, 
the fact that TechCrunch is to a large extent also a conference business. And so we had to reinvent our, um, you know, what, what, that exp what, what that looked like for an online audience. Luckily, I wasn't sort of a part of the, the core team doing a lot of that, but it did mean that one of the highlights of my year, which is like doing the Disrupt Conference had to happen from literally where I'm sitting now, although I did at least get a nice camera out of it. Um, and I would say the second thing is just what's been a lot harder is building new relationships because it's fine to have sort of, you know, um, let's say a startup raises some some funding and they want to talk about it, it's, it's fine to have like a 30 minute or 60 minute Zoom call and find out about the company. What's much more of a challenge is replicating the, the idea of like, oh, maybe a few weeks after that, we go and get drinks and I find out what they really think about their competitors and their investors. And, you know, and then maybe we start texting with each other, but like not having, you know, the con the, those kinds of informal real world interactions, I think has made the the job the building relationships part of the job a lot harder yeah i'd imagine that without the drinks you kind of get the usual talking points that the company puts out a little bit less <laughs> real the real stuff we'll have to grab some drinks sometime anthony <laughs> <laughs> i hope so i hope so i mean i will say that the, the one nice thing about this has been there there's a part of like the conversation where um of any conversation where there's sort of um, like an awkward kind of like, oh, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? And um, I feel like those conversations, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, got a lot more real because suddenly everyone was going through this completely crazy experience. And so you could at least, I wasn't getting like amazing scoops or anything from this, but at least you could get a sense of who the real person was because they had just had to deal with like 20, you know, suddenly um, doing constant childcare for their children, or they had, you know, they've been trapped in their studio apartment for days or, you know, who knows? Yeah, what I noticed when the pandemic started is the, the simple question that we usually start everything off with, which is, how are you? Or how are you doing? That became a much more lengthy discussion. Or, or <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So you, you are currently at TechCrunch. You've worked at VentureBeat. Um, if these aren't the two most premier startup scene publications, they're definitely two of the top publications covering the startup world today. Um, I think... A lot, obviously a lot of founders reach out to you and they probably also reach out to VentureBeat when they're trying to um, announce a close of one of their funding rounds or the launch of a new product or a new partnership, for example. What would you say is the, some of the main differences that you know from working at both TechCrunch and VentureBeat? What are the main differences between the two publications? Between the two publications? Well, I, I should say that I left VentureBeat in 2011, I believe. So um, I, it's, I can't necessarily generalize about how things work there nine, year, uh, you know, uh, nine years after I left. Um, so uh, take, take that with a grain of salt. I mean, certainly VentureBeat is, uh, was, and I think still is a, a smaller publication in terms of team, um, in terms of, of audience. And so um, I can't, you know, some of this maybe is like, there's a competitive aspect of like, you know, you know not wanting to uh, talk up the competition too much, but I will. I will also, in full disclosure, say that I do have you know a little bit of, of uh, VentureBeat stock, so I'm financially obligated to maybe to make them sound better. Actually, if anything, uh, but it, I, I would actually maybe then emphasize um, how much they're not different at the same time. That I remember when I was at VentureBeat, I sort of assumed that everything at TechCrunch ran much more smoothly. They had way more resources, they got way more scoops, and it was like this amazing machine. And so, and so I went from VentureBeat, spent a bit of time at Adweek, and then went to TechCrunch. And what I realized was that we, did have more, we do have more resources. We have more um, visibility in the, in the startup world. I think, you know, certainly people know what VentureBeat is, but many more people know what TechCrunch is. Um, and so that's nice. But in other ways, it's, it's not that different. It is... Um, a bunch of people trying to do the best job they, they can. And, and often, you know, usually it's the individual writers who are making the, the decisions about what to cover and, and what not to cover. There are editors at, at both publications, and I think they, you know, are, are involved in the, in the process. Certainly at TechCrunch, they're involved, but there's also, um, because, partly because of just how much news there is and how much we publish. In both cases, there's an element of, when, especially when there's not like, a big story, like we're talking today on like the, um, the day of the, the Senate tech hearings and or the latest in the series of Senate tech hearings. And so, you know, that would be something where an editor would step in and kind of got figure out who's going to help to cover what. 
But for a lot of things, um, it's really up to, it's really, they're both very writer driven organizations. Right. And, and I actually did want to talk about these tech hearings. Um, the regulation of big tech is a big topic. Um, I think it'll continue to be a big topic until we either do or don't see regulation. Um, I know that specifically Section 230 is something that is being hotly debated right now. Um, just for our listeners, Section 230 is a law that generally provides immunity for website publishers from third party content. So this is what keeps platforms like Facebook Twitter and Reddit from being liable for the content that's posted by their users. Um, what do you, do you have any thoughts on Section 230? Does it just need to be thrown out and written anew? Is it working fine and we just need to, um, when platforms abuse it, try to hold them liable as publishers? What do you think? Um, I, my, my inclination certainly is that I don't think that it's fine as, or I mean, I think it's an important protection and I do understand that it, part of what the debate about Section 230 gets at is this weird space that a lot of these tech platforms occupy because um, there's this constant argument of like, is Facebook a media company or a tech company, which can seem very like pedantic, but I think part of what it gets at is, is Facebook responsible for the stuff that you find on Facebook or are the individual users? And I think, I mean, the obvious answer is both. <laughs> there's some there's some shared responsibility, but um, I, I think that it, as I understand it, certainly I think that the Section 230 is probably gives a little bit too much blanket license, um, and and probably as the um, it, it seems regardless of regulation, there's been a lot of pressure on the the platforms to be more active in policing what kinds of content um, gets uh, published there, and I think on a lot of levels, that's a good thing. I think that, um, that that's probably something they should have, they should have done, um, a long time ago. Um, but so I, I think that the part of it is figuring out what the right regulatory framework is. And I don't have a good answer for that, but I suspect it's not what we have now, but it also wouldn't be treating, you know, Facebook as if it was a newspaper that should be sort of responsible in the same way for everything that it publishes. Right. And, and I brought this up on a previous episode of the podcast, which was that a lot of these tech hearings, these, um, these talks about regulation, they seem to be coming from people in the Senate and Congress who don't have a great understanding of what technology is in general or what these platforms do, how they make money, how, the, how they work, how the algorithms work behind the scenes. And so it seems like a lot of this talk of regulation is more to put on a show, um, maybe to appease their constituents for their next reelection that so they can turn around and say, hey, look, look at this two minute soundbite. I was really hard on Jeff Bezos. I was really hard on Mark Zuckerberg. Um, do you expect any real regulation to come out of this? Well, I, I think I first of all, I agree with a lot of what, what you're saying that a lot of it is about sort of showing um, you know, that, that they can be tough on, on these companies. And in some ways it reflects the fact that, that, that I think the, their people trust these tech companies less than they, than they used to. Um, it, it's also an interesting experience to watch them because you, you get these two, that you get sort of two sides that seem interested in regulating the platforms or in giving Jeff Bezos a hard time, but for very, very different reasons that for, um, from the democratic side, it's much more about are they too big? Do they have too much power? Um, and on the Republican side, it's much more about, are they censoring conservative voices? Um, and I suspect that the only way you, I think that, that if you saw really, that if Democrats held um, the House and took the Senate and took the presidency, I could imagine there being um, some degree of regulation I would be very surprised if it led to a significant breakup of, of like Facebook, which they've certainly talked about, but I just think that would be such a big and unpopular move that, and it, it seems like, um, I mean, now we're getting into things that, I mean, I've, I was a political reporter in the past, but it's not really something I focus on now. So this, this may be all BS, but my, my feeling is that there will probably be some level of regulation if we see a democratic majority, but um, it's not necessarily gonna be a dramatic change. Do you say that because you think the Democrats are more likely to put regulation through? Or is it that you just think that when one party or the other has a controlling 
uh, interest, that then the regulations will come through? Um, I think it's probably more that I think, I mean, I think the Democrats are more interested in regulation in, in, in general. Um, and so there's that sense, I think that, you know, it's also true that you, I think you would need, um, since, it, since it seems like the, the approach to this is so kind of schizophrenic right now, you would need basically one party to be dominant, like you said, and that just seems more likely to be the Democrats in the near future. Yeah, and then I think um, one aspect of this regulation of big tech, specifically social media platforms that isn't talked about enough, is the idea that um, regulation might actually benefit some of these large established players who have teams of lawyers uh, as, and might actually be create a disadvantage to small social media startups who don't have the legal team to navigate these regulations and are maybe trying to you know overtake facebook or snapchat or twitter do you think that um it's possible that some of these social media platforms encourage regulation for this reason i think that is a component of it in the sense that um i'm i'm not well i think that probably they they would want any regulation to that comes out to be something that is favorable to them of course um uh and and certainly a, one of the effects that that i hear a lot about i haven't necessarily seen a lot of data about this but anecdotally i've heard that the gdpr which is the privacy regulation in europe um which um in a lot of ways i think it was a it seemed like an important step and a lot of people point to is like saying it's it's great somebody took these steps on a consumer level of like hey, you actually have to ask before you take this kind of data, but has had the sort of unintended effect of a lot of media and advertising startups really can't make it work anymore because they have to deal with all this, you know, these, these sort of regulatory hurdles, whereas a Facebook or a Google, that's just an additional cost to them. They can figure it out. And, and they have, you know, access to way more data than, than anyone else. Um, and so I, I think you're, I, I don't know how much of this is like a plan that they would like regulation, but certainly I think that if regulation comes down, there's, there's a good chance that it won't necessarily hurt the, the big companies as much as it hurts startups. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, let me turn now to two trends that we're seeing in the media. Um, the, and both are kind of held together by a particular company, but I'm not really trying to get you to comment on the company so much as the trend. So the okay. first is platforms like Medium, which help anybody become basically a publisher, in some cases, uh, people referring to themselves as citizen journalists. Um, is this a net benefit because now new ideas can be heard, anybody can be heard, or is it, a, is it a threat to maybe drowning out or stealing attention from the people with expertise who are covering these topics? What are, what are your general thoughts on the idea that now anybody can publish content online? I think that intellectually, I'm, I'm very much for it because I do think that, the, that fundamentally there's not... Um, there's no, you know, there's, there's no reason certainly that anyone can do like the job that I do. I don't think I have like any special qualifications or, I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm good at it, but, but, you know, journalists aren't credentialed. They aren't, there's no like body that can say, oh, you are not, you are or are not um, a licensed journalist, at least in, in the United States, it works differently in other countries. But, um, and, and so I, to a certain extent, I think like the, the more the merrier and that like, we should, we should have more competition. We should have to justify um, our positions of authority. I think the last few years have certainly test, uh, put a little bit of a wrinkle on my, my, my full conviction on that. I do think that what's hard is that there's just so much in, like information out there and so much of it is misinformation and so much of it, and that we don't seem to have good mechanisms right now for sorting the good from the bad. And, and that one of the, the most basic, um, ways to do that is just by um, looking at the publication. I mean, I know this is something that you think thought about a lot, um, but that like, I, you know, I don't uncritically accept everything that's published by the New York Times, but I know that there's like a basic level of adherence to journalistic standards when I see a story there. Uh, and I might still criticize that. I might still like roll my eyes at the conclusion, but I know that like, 
probably there weren't a, that the, the goal of this wasn't like a complete like fabrication. Whereas you come to a news article that's by some publication you've never heard of, um, and uh, you you don't have that reassurance. Um, that's a little bit different, I suppose, from the question of like citizen journalism. But I think that those things start to blur together because it's mm -hmm. it's getting at this question of like anyone can sort of call themselves a journalist right now. And and I guess my ultimate conclusion is that's a good thing, or I mean, regardless of whether it's a good thing, that's just the reality, um, but it does create new problems. And, and certainly it, like, while we're in this period where no one really knows exactly how to sort through, or I think regular people certainly don't really know how to sort of sort through a lot of this, it, it puts a lot more pressure on the individual consumer of the news to, to really think critically and, and figure out if a, if a story makes sense and if it seems believable and if it seems like somebody has really uh, done reporting or if they're just sort of repeating some BS. Yeah, and the other trend I wanted to hear your thoughts on is what we're seeing with, stub, uh, with Substack, sorry. Um, obviously some writers, even from prominent uh, publications are leaving to go create their private paywalled newsletters on Substack um, because like kind of the New York Times, which is being the most successful with their subscriptions, um, these really prominent writers who have their own fan bases, their own audiences are able to kind of take that over to Substack and leverage it into a direct payment subscription model just for their content. Is this something that we're going to see more and more of, or we're only really, it, it might only really work for the people who are able to bring their audience over like a Casey Newton. Um, is this a, is this going to become kind of the next age of social media and media publication? I, it's interesting because I really like newsletters as a reading experience. Um, I like just sort of that kind of uh, the sense of the kind of regular publication and like it comes to you. Um, I've always been sort of skeptical about this model um, or, or rather skeptical that there are a ton of writers who can make it work financially. And I think so far I've been proven wrong that like, you know, there, there are a lot more people I would, you know, I'm not close friends with Casey, but I know Casey and, and I was very surprised to see him go. And, and I think um, it was sort of <clears throat> thought he had a pretty good gig and, and why would I, why would he want to give that up? Um, not to be, I mean, there are a number of other uh, very notable writers who, who've done that. And, um, and so I, I don't know the full extent. I think, it, I think it's certainly going to happen more. And, and some of that is because of reader demand. I think some of that is because Substack realizes that this is a growing area for them. So they're, they're going to do a lot of recruiting and, and all, you know, I think a little, some advanced payments and things like that to try to encourage people to, to make the leap. And I, I think on the whole, that's a good thing. I think that seeing what these writers can do on their own um, is really ex exciting. Um, my sort of two caveats on that are I think that you, certainly at TechCrunch, it, this is a place where, uh, you know, you can write with your own voice. You tend to, that it gives you a lot of visibility. Whether or not that carries over is, I think there's sort of a, a mixed track record on that. So that like, for example, um, if, the, if, if Anthony Ha left and started his own newsletter, um, I don't think it would be like a complete disaster, but I think I, it's also important to recognize that a lot of people know who I am because of TechCrunch and um, whether or not they would subscribe to Newsland, particularly if they would pay to hear my thoughts on technology or media or whatever, I think um, uh, are not, you know, I think, I don't think that's necessarily a huge audience. And I'm not saying that just to be self-deprecating, but I think there are a lot of journalists who are in that boat, who are, we are good at our jobs. People know who we are, but we aren't necessarily going to attract huge paying audiences. Yeah, I think the the obvious benefit to staying with a major publication is, like you said, their name lends you a little bit more credibility, but also the distribution. When you go behind Substack or you create kind of a paywalled newsletter, your articles or your content just can't reach as many people. And I can understand if um, that's not the top priority for many writers, but I think I think it really is the top priority for many writers. It's just what I write, I want as many people in the world to read as possible. I think the benefit of what we're seeing with Substack is that authors 
um, seem to be taking control of their own brands more. And this is kind of the, the new trend that I see happening here. And it's something that we have, it's built into our thesis at Creditor too, is that authors should have their own reputation scores, their own credibility, and it shouldn't necessarily be um, attached to the outlet because, you know, somebody at, at TechCrunch, for example, you can have good writers or bad writers and it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not just a level playing field. So I like that that is happening, that people are starting to take their reputations, take their audiences and saying, I don't need anything else. I can go monetize my audience on my own. So yeah, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, two, two questions here that are really about your writing. Um, one, the first is, what is the most important news story that you've ever worked on? Oh, that's interesting. Um, the most important news story that I've ever worked on. I mean, I think that probably, um, and I'm not necessarily the, the main person involved in this, but just the coverage of um, how Facebook and Twitter and all these other platforms have responded after the 2016 election and, and sort of the general consensus that there was a lot of misinformation and maybe this had a, a real impact on the outcome of the election um, and, and tracking those changes. It, that, that might be the, the, the most important thing, which again, I'm only sort of uh, tangentially, we have other people who are sort of more, much more focused on the politics side of it, but just covering those, like how that impacts the advertising business and impacts how they work on, um, you know, how they work with news publishers and things like that is probably the, the, the biggest. Um, I mean, in general, I would say that uh, at TechCrunch, you know, because we're not necessarily spending a ton of time on any individual story, hopefully enough time, um, it, it tends to be, the, the impact tends to focus less on like an individual story and more, you know, trying to, to stay on top of a narrative or a trend over time. Well, that's perfect because my next question was actually what news story should everybody be following? So this could be a news story that is already kind of top of mind, but you think it really deserves to stay top of mind or maybe one that is completely underappreciated. In tech? And not necessarily, like it just in news in general. Um, what is a uh -huh. big breaking story, something that's happening in the world that people should be watching closely? Um. I would say that sort of one that I, f I feel very strongly about is, um, and I think has been get getting a, a decent amount of coverage, but um, could probably get more coverage and could probably get more attention is, is voting rights. I mean, I think that it seems like um, there's a lot of things about voting in the United States, at least, that aren't um, ideal. And, and um, that I think that's been true for a long time, but the fact that we're sort of that it seems like a lot more attention is being focused on that right now and how that, um, how that's, you know, the, the coronavirus has only made those challenges more intense. Um, I think that that's really, really important work. And I, I feel like, you know, regardless of what your um, political leanings are, that, that hopefully you feel invested in having a, a functional at least, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who lives in the United States, um, that you feel invested in the U.S. having a, a functional democracy. And I don't think we, we do if, we, if, you know, huge swaths of the population can't vote. Yeah. And do you think, do you have any predictions about what's going to happen in the next month? Obviously, we have the election in less than a week. Um, it's all, all signs are pointing to us not knowing a clear winner um, within days of the actual voting, it's probably going to drag out a, a week or two weeks, maybe even three. And we, you know, we know about the media, they're all going to be running kind of a 24 seven news cycle. Um, how messy is this going to get? Do you have any predictions? I think that it is going to be, um, I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I think like what, what is going to be true more than anything is, yeah. Cause I don't know. I mean, I, I go to the same forecast sites that a lot of other people do. I spend a lot of time on 538. Um, and so it, it does seem like we're going, you know, that, that, that there's going to be a Biden victory. The question is that certainly a very, I think a very clear victory on election day will play out, will result in very different kinds of news coverage than one where information trickles in over time, 
there's more contested ballots and, and it sort of comes down to the wire in, in a few key states. Um, and I think that from a media perspective, what I think generally happens is that there's like a single narrative that kind of hardens in, into place. And it's like becomes very, very, um, very hard to shake that, 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 you know, if, if it, if, if within the few, if for the first few hours, the, you know, there's a number of reporters basically saying, okay, like it's pure chaos and we don't, we're not gonna, we don't know who the winner is, regardless of whether or not enough like ballots come in to like, or, or to within the, shortly after then it's like, oh, actually it's very clear who won. Um, that's going to sort of set into place. And so um, if, if there's anything I, I sort of worry about from a media perspective, it's that is that, you know, we'll sort of, that a narrative will form before there's a, an, enough information in place. Yeah, one of those narratives that is um, somewhat expected, and this isn't my term, is the red mirage. Um, is that something that you're kind of referring to? Um, actually, I don't think I've heard that term. Do you want, do you want to tell me a little bit yeah, more about oh, it? Sorry. So the red mirage concept, again, not my term, is the idea that uh, Republicans tend to vote more in person on election day and that a lot of these mail-in ballots are going to be um, predominantly Democratic votes. And so right. on election day or, or on election night, it's going to appear like just an enormous landslide victory for Republicans, but that it will be these kind of trickling in of these mail-in ballots that will eventually um, overtake what's been called as the red mirage. And that that will either really upset Republicans who feel like there's foul play. Um, and this kind of this concept of a red mirage, if it's, if it's, if uh, President Trump takes it and runs with it, and that becomes the solidified narrative, as, as you said, that that could create some really heated contested election. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's definitely one of the scenarios that, that I'm worried about. I mean, I think that um, part of what 2020 has trained all of us on, and, and I think the next week or so will we'll definitely reinforce is just being comfortable with some degree of uncertainty. And, and I can certainly imagine, um, you know, a number of different sort of chaotic, I think that that's probably a, a big one that, um, you know, that it, that sort of all the ballots coming in at first are going in one direction. And, and like you said, if it's in person, um, that that could lean red and then mail-in leans a different way or, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of early voting going on. I, I, I just, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm sort of, I think that because you sort of see the way that, that these, I'm worried about that scenario, but more broadly, I'm, I'm, I'm just worried that, um, you know, people are going to sort of make these, these declarations before it's really clear what, what's actually going on. Yeah, I agree. I think that's going to be the biggest problem. And I'm sure we're going to see it from some publications uh, at the very least. Um, oh, for sure. So I have two final questions. They're questions, they're a little bit silly. Uh, I'll okay. um, and I ask them of every guest that comes on the podcast. But before we get to those last two questions, can you give listeners uh, where they should go to follow your work or your work at TechCrunch? whether your Twitter handle, email, if you want to give that out, where should people follow your work? Um, I, the easiest way is just to go to techcrunch.com um, and you'll, you'll see my stories there. If you are a hardcore Anthony Ha fan, you can also go to techcrunch.com slash author slash Anthony dash Ha. No one's going to do that. Just Google Anthony Ha and you'll, you'll see a page with all of my articles. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Anthony Ha. Okay, great. All right, so for the last two questions, question number one, is Bitcoin? Are you a believer or not so much? Oh no, I'm I'm not a believer at all. I mean, I, I think that that there are probably places where the technology is is applicable and and could bring more transparency. Um, I am extremely skeptical that it will do anything to replace our current financial system. Interesting. Okay, and uh, for our very last question, are we living in a simulation? Yes or no? No, no, no. I mean, but partly because I mean, I, I think it's, it's in a way like an unanswerable question because I can never prove that we're not living in a simulation. Right. So um, I guess on the A, I just think, it, you know, then you just have to act as if we're not. And B, then it just comes down to sort of instinctively when you hear that, what, what do you sort of what, what's your uh, default assumption? And my assumption is that we are not. 
Would you act differently if you thought we were in a simulation? Because I, I personally have thought about it and I, I don't think I would act differently either way. Um, I would, I would act a little differently in that I would try to find ways out of the simulation, I suppose, or evidence of, so I think like, um, I think there are small ways, but maybe in big ways it wouldn't, right? Because we're in, in this simulation model, like everyone else is still a real person who's, well-being matters and whose feelings matter. It just is whether or not we're all living in this um, completely simulated environment. So in that sense, maybe like my life wouldn't be dramatically different. Maybe um, I could be completely comfortable with the idea of, um, okay, we're all living in a simulation together, but it still matters and the work I do still matters and, and the relationships I have still matter. Uh, but I guess <laughs> I, I haven't... Um, it's interesting because I'm a big science fiction fan. And so I read a lot of Philip K. Dick, um, especially when I was a teenager, um, although I still think he's great. Um, and a lot of his stories involve sort of simulations being torn down. So when I think about simulations, I think about that. I think about the moment when the sort of illusion is re revealed. Um, the idea of a simulation that just remains in place and nobody really knows about it, uh, I guess is, I mean, obviously I've heard about it. Everybody at, th at this point has heard about it. But I haven't thought about sort of the emotional impact uh, of that and, and whether or not it would make a difference. I think I, it sounds like you wouldn't necessarily do anything different. And I, I think it, it's sort of the same, that there would be an adjustment process, but it wouldn't matter in the long run. Right. Yeah. Because your reality is still your reality. And hopefully you're living a life that is the most enjoyable and you're working on what you care about anyway. Yeah. I, yeah, well, I think I think that's right. Well, great. Thank you for that. And um, with that, this has been another great episode of the Credit Podcast. This is Anthony Ha, again, senior writer at TechCrunch, covering media and advertising. And I hope everyone listening goes and follows his work. Anthony, thank you so much for your time on today's show. Thank you. This is so much fun.